We're going to start today. Uh, hello and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Programs Homeowner Webinar Series. My name is Jen Marvin. I'm the Florida Yards and Neighborhood Statewide Coordinator under the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Today we have Aaron Alvarez speaking about plant explorers. Your microphones have been muted. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Please stick around until the end of the presentation to take the survey. It helps me give you the kind of programming you like and lets us know how we're doing. Our next presentation will be August 16th at 11 a.m. Eastern time on gardening for bees. Uh, so with that, I'll let Erin Alvarez introduce herself and um, take it away. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you to FFL for having me. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with y'all today and uh, presenting on one of my favorite topics, which is plant exploration. Uh, since Jen didn't get to introduce me, I will introduce myself. I am a lecturer with the Environmental Horticulture Department, and I have the honor of having a 100% teaching appointment here at UF. I teach undergraduates, and my specialty is uh, people-plant interactions, uh, student development, but my background is in public horticulture, public gardens management, uh, and landscape design. And so as part of my background, I get to, and as part of my job, I get to read really interesting books and do research on different topics to try to convey that content to students uh, in classes to develop my courses and other resources. So one of the things that I love about uh, plants is we can look at them as a hobby and also as a profession, which I didn't realize until late in life. I, uh, before I discovered horticulture, I had a degree in English. I worked at the Alligator newspaper managing their advertising office briefly. Um, and then eventually I realized, hey, this stuff I do on the weekends, I can do as a job. And so I went to school for horticulture and landscape design and haven't looked back since. I was fortunate to work in the industry before I came to UF. And so a lot of my experience is informed by how people use plants both in a, a commercial manner, right? How we make our livings, living from plants, but also how people use plants in a recreational or a life enrichment way. And part of my role now is conveying that to students. Uh, and as I've mentioned in developing courses, I get to do a little bit of research. And one of my favorite courses to teach is public gardens management. And this course has evolved. I inherited it from a faculty member who taught it for a long time before me. And I kind of converted it a little bit when I took it over. And in doing so, I tried to look at how we came to acquire the plants we have. And so I read a lot of books and did some research and developed this talk and it's evolved over the years. So if you've seen this talk before, um, it's changed a bit, but it's very similar. However, the focus of it has changed. And before we get started, I just wanted to uh, take a moment and Jen, did we, are we looking for feedback from folks in the chat about where they're from or was that just for folks in the chat to see? Um, that was just for folks to, to take up their time till we started. Okay, cool. So I can't we're good. Okay, I can't see what people said, but if anyone's from Tampa area, Gainesville, uh, Florida, welcome and shout out to y'all. Um, so one of the things that I want you to think about uh, before we get started is a way that uh, you might have sought out a plant. Hopefully if you're watching this, you're interested in plants, right? Or you're interested in plant exploration, but take a minute, whether you're a professional, a homeowner, um, most of y'all are probably homeowners or a master gardener. What's a time in your life when you've tried to learn more about a plant? What motivated you? Um, what was it about the plant that interested you or fascinated you? I'm gonna pause for a minute to let people think if you're watching live or recording, take a minute and just consider that. I know for me, one of my earliest memories about plants was gardening alongside my great grandmother. And once she taught me that I could collect seeds from the poppies in her garden and the marigolds in her garden, I was determined to find out every flower that I could where I could collect seeds from, right? And looking back, that was a form of plant exploration. And when I look at what a lot of us do today, our colleagues, our students, um, we're basically doing the same thing, just in different formats. And so what I wanna talk to y'all today about are a little bit about the origins of some of our favorite plants that have come to the United States, and then also uh, what plant exploration is, how it relates to our personal experiences with plants and exploring for plants, and also where plant exploration is going in the future. All right, I'm gonna share a screen. We should be old hat at this, which I've just jinxed myself by saying that. One second. You get to listen to me hum, this is what my students do. Um, and so I hope, did anybody think about their first experiences with plants? Many of y'all may have had um, a professional experience, right? Maybe you took a job 
and your very first uh, experience with plants was maybe looking something up. I know one of my very first positions working in the plant field was at a wholesale garden center. And I didn't know many of the plants botanical names at that point. And so I had to go and learn, <clears throat> excuse me, everything I could about the plants on site. And so we had to, uh, they gave me a big thick book. It was Dr. Durr's Woody Plant Reference Manual. And if any of y'all know that, you're familiar with the fact that it's a tome. Um, and my job was to go and learn everything that I could about those plants. And again, just like as a child, I was motivated to go and learn everything I could about the plants that uh, my grandmother showed me. I also, as a professional, learned the value in knowing everything about plants. When people started to call and ask questions about plant material, uh, I learned enough about them to share that information. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking and share. Palm Beach County. Oh, I see the county's coming in. It's yes, open now. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, it looked like our chat function was uh, disabled for some reason. I think I fixed it now. So, Aaron, feel free to ask questions of the audience at this point, and they should be able to respond to you in chat. Thank you. Okay, I did forget to mention this part. Uh, questions I love. Uh, if we see questions in the chat that are pertinent to the slide, I'll be happy to answer them. We'll have a period at the end where I'm happy to answer questions for as long as we have, so we may hold some till the end. Um, but if I ask, you know, hey, someone weigh in on this, feel free to ping in the chat. And if I don't see it, uh, Jen can help out. So, oh, good. I'm seeing lots of information about plants in here. So if y'all do want to share one of your early experiences with plants, please do. I'll keep an eye here in the chat as I share screen. I see some folks from Putnam, Orange County. Uh, somebody had an experience with plants mulching under trees. Yeah, I did you know mulching under the tree. There's a whole other talk about that if there hasn't been already. All right, gardening with your grandparents. Yeah, a lot of us learn from our elders, right? Our ancestors and our elders. Some of y'all are motivated to learn about natives and plants for pollinators, right? And so that kind of information or that type of motivation is often motivated by either uh, a desire for personal interest, but it might also be a desire to help the environment, right? Or help um, something outside of yourself. Many of us, our first experiences of exploring or learning about plants, can y'all see that okay? Is my bar blocking out the screen or can y'all see the screen? You're fine. Okay, excellent. Um, hello, Mike Klukey. I see Venetian Falls in Venice. Hello, I remember you from my extension days. Uh, Live Oak Elementary School. Yeah, a lot of us were introduced to plants in elementary school. And so maybe the exploration was done by our teachers, but it was to motivate that curiosity in us. Um, and many of y'all probably work with students in schools and get to see this on a day-to-day -day basis. So here's my talk, uh, the, uh, the title said, excuse me, here's my contact information. If you have questions, feel free to email me. My uh, email is there, it's erinalvarez at ufl.edu. And as always, I'm happy to share information or resources. So as I talked about earlier, uh, what a plant explorer is, we're gonna go into a couple different concepts here, plant exploration and plant hunting. Uh, a plant explorer is someone who looks to discover information about plants. So the examples we gave, the things we were just talking about, those who seek, <clears throat> pardon me, to uh, seek to discover or document plants. So what are we talking about when we say discover or document? Well, many of y'all have probably done this, right? You make an, a list of plants that you want to include in your garden. You've just done some exploration to document and discover plants. This is also done at the professional level where maybe a nursery wants to sell a new type of house plant. So they go in out and find plant material uh, that will work for what they're trying to do and then make it available for commercial use. Breeders do this, botanists do this to document things. Um, there's often a lot of overlap between plant exploration and plant hunting. And the reason is because plant exploration often leads to or is motivated by plant hunting. We go out to try to learn more about plants and sadly, there are very few of us who are out trying to learn about plants just for the sake of acquiring knowledge, but that's often who these plant explorers are. And we'll talk about some modern day plant explorers and what their skill sets are and what they are tasked with doing here in a few minutes. But when we think about photographers, how many of y'all photograph nature? I saw a few folks do um, painting, art, using plants or trying to document plant material in these ways is plant exploration. Similarly, uh, going and looking for new medicines or new plants to hybridize to find drought tolerant options, uh, going to a botanical garden and geeking out over the biggest peony that you've ever seen. Emily, I think you might have been here for this moment or unless this was a student trip, um, but that's another form of plant exploration. So that curiosity we'll see come up time and again as we go through the talk today. What is a plant hunter? A plant hunter is someone who's looking to acquire, whether they're looking for a collection 
uh, for commercial possibilities, uh, for research, for an herbarium specimen, that's typically someone who's um, looking to, that's the difference between a hunter and an explorer. Sometimes people do both, and we'll see many examples of this going forward. The reason I mentioned these differences is because when we think about modern day plant exploration and plant hunting, there's some ramifications that lead to conservation issues, um, ethnobotanical issues, bioprospecting that uh, really toe that line between exploration and hunting. And we'll talk about that again as we go forward. So when we think about plant exploration, I love this quote from Carl Linnaeus. Uh, if you don't know Carl Linnaeus, he's considered the father of binomial nomenclature, our modern taxonomic uh, system for plants and animals, all living things. But he had a quote that he wrote in Glory of the Scientist back in 1700. So I will, I'll read it, but you can read it there on the slide. But for those who might be uh, listening or prefer to hear it, when I consider the melancholy fate of so many of botany's votaries, I'm tempted to ask whether men are in their right mind who so desperately risk life and everything else through their love of collecting plants. And I love that collecting is in single quotes there. <laughs> so does this ring familiar for any of you? I know it does for me. Uh, I know uh, I, I'm a self-identified plant nerd and plant nerds at our heart typically are plant explorers and we're often plant hunters. Um, but how many folks have gone to extreme lengths to try to collect a plant? Uh, maybe we spent a little more than we wanted to from an awesome place like Plant Delights Nursery, or maybe we just pestered a friend too much uh, at dinner trying to ask about their plant collection, and it might be in good ways, right? Uh, so, you know, maybe Linnaeus wasn't in it for the love of the plants. I know a lot of people who were, and a lot of our plant explorers are in it just because they love the work of plant exploration and they love what they do. This is an example of a graduate student, or this isn't a graduate student, an example of a plant explorer uh, out in Hawaii. And she's scouting for native and also invasive plants to do some control of invasives and uh, tracking uh, native plants. And she is also a plant explorer. She's a huge plant nerd. And she's doing this for research. It's her job, but also for the love of plants. And I would say this is risking, you know, life and limb for the love of collecting in some ways. We also see people who are just motivated just because they're passionate about what they do. And this also speaks to the heart of both plant exploration and exploration in general. Sir Edmund Hillary said, nobody climbs mountains for scientific reasons. Science is used to raise money for the expeditions, but you really climb for the heck of it. Um, and he didn't say heck, but I will, because we're a family, family show here. But as you know, Sir Edmund Hillary was an explorer, climber, mountaineer, did a lot of other things as well. But this also explains a lot of my friends' motivations, my colleagues, acquaintances, people we study, their motivations for exploring for plants. It's often just because they want to. We'll go through and look at some plant explorers through history, but we'll see some interesting uh, parallels here, examples replicated again of what we've just talked about. Many explorers were looking for various things around the world and inadvertently discovered plants, or they were intending to find plants. But we also have lots of plant explorers currently who really aren't interested in what's gonna happen with the plant material apart from a responsibility and ethical standpoint. They just wanna go out and find new things. And a lot of the plant explorers we see today are these people who just go out to climb the mountain, that they go out looking for the plants. So why do we collect plants? We've mentioned passion. We've mentioned uh, learning more about our ecosystems or wildlife. We've learned trying to educate others. We've talked about um, just experimenting, right? But when we talk about why we collect plants, uh, somebody in the chat give me a reason we haven't mentioned for plant collection. Can anyone think of something besides just for the love? I know that for some it's just to have all of the Hoyas or all of the succulents you can find, right? Uh, I see some medicine. Yep, great, Jen. That's perfect food, right? Lots of very practical bottom pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy reasons for collecting plants besides the passion. They're very practical reasons. This is great because one of the things we saw, the next generation exactly, posterity, one of the key pillars of agriculture, which led to our society developing the way it has, was plant propagation, plant selection, which was all at its heart, plant exploration, people looking for plants to solve problems or help them survive or thrive. Um, money, yes, one of our modern day necessities. Um, and then various other interests come up, come about, right? We have examples through history of folks who were exploring just for the sake of exploring. They might've been trying to map or look for resources. And we learn about them in history uh, for what they found, what they did, the role they played in our historical context. But often 
these people were also amazing plant explorers. They might have documented plants that had never been known before to Europeans. Uh, they might have discovered new ways to use plants for medicinal or food purposes or commercial purposes. In many cases, they were exploring or trying to collect plants for education and medicinal reasons. So here, if you see the image, I know it's small, I apologize, but this is a painting of the Lyceum. Um, and this is, let me see if I can make this a little bit easier for folks to see. Hopefully that'll be a little bit more to scale for y'all. Um, I know some people collect to share, and this was, uh, whether it's for education or just for the joy of sharing, this is at the heart of how plants were used back in the time of Aristotle. And so most folks know of Aristotle because uh, of his philosophy, uh, what we've read about him, but very few folks realize that he also spurred a lot of plant collecting and a lot of plant exploration. As part of the teaching at the Lyceum, they had a garden and they used that to teach everything from examples of philosophy to basic biology to medicine. And so as part of his collecting, Aristotle established really way before Linnaeus, one of the first systems of naming that was binomial nomenclature that we see in Europe. He doesn't get credit for it. Linnaeus gets all the credit because that's how it evolved today. Um, but this is where we saw a lot of our modern European school of plant exploration and botany begin. One of his students was Theophrastus, who we know is the father of botany. Uh, he wrote De Historia Plantarum, which is still used today. Um, but if you've studied botany, you know Theophrastus' name. And this initially began, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Lyceum with Aristotle. There was another famous student of Aristotle's. I don't know if anyone can think of who it is. While you're thinking, if you know, put it in the chat. I don't know if y'all can see it. I see a little shadow. And while we are waiting, there is a shout out in the chat for seed, which I'm always up for seed sharing. So uh, I spoiled it. I advanced the slide. So Alexander the Great was a student of Aristotle's. We know Alexander the Great for the movies, right? No, <laughs> for his exploration. Uh, he was also a plant explorer. He, as part of his travels, was on a mission for Aristotle to collect plants. And we have documented communication, uh, or historians, I don't have it, uh, documented communication between the two of them where Alexander would go exploring and write letters back to Aristotle talking about these amazing plants that he discovered and would collect them to bring them back. Um, the means of acquisition, obviously, uh, are a little bit shady sometimes. Often these plants, and we'll see this again, uh, sometimes these plants were willingly shared with explorers. Other times they were obtained illicitly, uh, much to the detriment of the hosts uh, or the, the folks who initially had the plants, the indigenous folks or the locals. Um, but today that's changing a bit. In Aristotle or in Aristotle and Alexander's time, I'm, I'm presuming it was part of the conquest, right? But we see that he corresponded with Aristotle about bamboo as he traveled Asia and China. We also have evidence that he talked about cotton, pepper, spices like cardamom, um, ginger, cinnamon, banyan trees, and even citrus. There's some question in uh, history books, and I'm not a scholar of classics, but I, I did read that there's a little bit of question about what the golden apples of mythology were. Some folks uh, mentioned they might have actually been apples. Others think it could have been citrus or oranges that were uh, brought about or inspired by these travels. So Alexander the Great, I don't know if many of y'all thought of him as a plant explorer. I didn't until I did a little bit of research, but uh, he did help get information about plants back to Europe. As many of us who studied history know, uh, the 15th century, the age of exploration was effectively Europe going all around the globe uh, looking for resources. And they uh, were also looking for knowledge, information about what the world looked like. Um, and we're trying to find more of what had been brought back by many of explorers like Eris or like Alexander the Great or um, Marco Polo, who went to China and brought back a lot of spices. And that turned that exploration uh, into hunting where people needed more. They realized it was a great resource. Um, it would change uh, society in many parts of Europe with some of these acquisitions. And so we see this motivation behind exploration during this period of time to be spices. What are spices? They're plants. So as we know, uh, folks were looking for a lot of resources, but spices were a key driving factor for Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, exploring the globe. They were basically competing for access to what? Spices, which we don't always think about this in history, at least my history teacher never said plants, he just said spices, <laughs> um, but that's what they were looking for. They were going looking for plant material. So who can name an explorer from this area? Hopefully, I think there's a delay in the chat, but hopefully someone's shouting out a couple of explorers right now. I know in school, we learned about uh, all of the, uh, the European explorers like Christopher Columbus. And we know Christopher Columbus for lots of reasons. Thank you, Aaron Marco Polo, yep. Um, and the history is 
not always bright, but one thing that we do know is he was responsible for introducing a lot of plants from the Americas back to Europe. Um, plants that revolutionized European economy, food, cultures in many ways. And so one thing that he was looking for, in addition to a passage or a way to circum, a way to India that way, was looking for spices. He wanted to get to India and the Indies to try to find plant material. What he found when he arrived uh, were often willingly shared with the folks that he found and then uh, later on weren't so willingly shared or were taken uh, without choice. But we saw the results of that. We still see that today in our modern horticultural practices. So things like tobacco, potatoes, which we know how that went in Europe when potatoes were brought back. Um, tomatoes, which again, weren't initially from Europe, but are now a key part of many cultures in Europe. Also, he brought uh, old world plants, plants from, oh, pardon me, Europe and uh, his area to the new world, which we now consider to be staple crops in many parts of our country. Things like wheat, barley, sugarcane, grapevines, but these weren't in indigenous, these weren't native plants to the Americas. So we saw a cross pollination, if you will, uh, of plant materials. When we think about our native versus invasive plants, uh, this is kind of changing a bit, but one of the traditional markers for a plant being invasive versus native was, was it present at the point of European contact? Uh, some of us and some research does question, was there uh, exchange of plants before that that might not necessarily make that benchmark uh, as resolute as many folks once held it to be? And we see evidence that there was trade and exchange of plants well before our documented official point of European contact. And it was through exploration practices like this. We also know that explorers like Vasco da Gama uh, had a role in plant exploration. When they landed at Tierra del Fuego, he was written to have exclaimed for Christ, right? So the church first and spices. So plants, first the church and then plants. We see where their priorities were. Why were spices so important? It wasn't that people just wanted to diversify their palates, which they did, but they were incredibly valuable. And so there was one point at which black pepper was as valuable as gold, if not more so. We also saw during ancient history, uh, pre this time period, black pepper had immense value to the Roman Empire and the Goths, uh, the Germans, predating the Germans, uh, who had pepper, where they were able to effectively hold off a siege of Romans because they had a stash of pepper um, that they were threatening to destroy, but the Romans wanted it. So pepper had incredible value very early on, and we saw it drove exploration later, uh, even though we now know explorers for these other things. But black pepper was a huge role during this time period. We uh, look at other explorers. Uh, if you all are familiar with Joseph Arnold, uh, he was an explorer that uh, was familiar, or excuse me, famous for going around and he had a botanist. We'll talk more about this journey in a while. But one really interesting thing that uh, Joseph Arnold did was he led a journey to collect to Sumatra, uh, led a botanical expedition, excuse me, to Southeast Asia. One of the places they stopped was Sumatra. I get excited about this story. I get ahead of myself because like many plant explorers, I love stories about plants, and I hope some of y'all do too. I should mention a lot of things we're doing is talking about stories, but one of the things I loved about history, studying it, one of the things I love about plants is, I don't know if any of you all also uh, enjoy kind of the behind the scenes story that you don't always get in the official version, but you know, when you go and talk to somebody after the fact and ask them for some cuttings and you share some plants, you get the, the backstory. So here's a little backstory on this plant. This is a really cool plan. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a type of corpse flower. The common names are always something like corpse flower, but uh, it's a Rafelsia arnoldii. And it was discovered uh, by Joseph Arnold, excuse me, described by Joseph Arnold. It was had been used by the folks in Sumatra for a long period of time for various reasons. But we're not gonna talk about that. What we are gonna talk about is the fact that when he discovered it, uh, it emits a stench of decaying flesh because it's pollinated by beetles, carrion insects, et cetera. And so when these European folks came upon this flower, they'd never experienced anything like it before. They thought someone had died. Part of the journey that uh, Joseph Arnold was on was uh, a responsibility to both find plants, but also he had to take under his wing the son of his benefactor. So the guy who was funding the journey said, I got this son, he needs something to do. Why don't you take him with you and teach him botany? Well, Joseph Arnold was very legitimately interested in botany. He didn't take this role lightly, but apparently this person did not take things seriously. He was, you know, kind of goofed off. There were stories about him getting in trouble for wandering off and risking harm to the expedition. And so when Joseph Arnold found this plant that was terribly offensive to his senses, he said, you know, I'm going to do you a big honor and I'm going to name this plant after you. And so Sir Thomas Raffles, who was the annoying party in question, 
now is the namesake, uh, or is the namesake for this plant uh, as it's described in a botanical way. So the stories of plant exploration, sometimes the plants that were found, sometimes the names they have are not just about, oh, this person discovered it, and so it's named for them. There's often another story behind what was actually found. So, oh, another fun fact about this plant, it's on the slide. I didn't say it specifically, but it's the world's largest single flower. So um, it's another really interesting uh, botanical curiosity. If you don't know this plant, look it up. Fascinating. So some other explorers, oh, we haven't talked about England and most folks are familiar with English explorers. If you're a Floridian, you're very familiar with the folks I'm gonna be talking about or if you studied Florida history. And this is the Bartrams. Uh, we know the Bartrams because they explored Florida. They were naturalists. They were keen plantsmen. They did a lot to uh, develop plant trade and horticulture in the Americas during their time period. They were initially from Pennsylvania, and it was a father and son. And if you've read their, if you haven't read their writings, I recommend it. Uh, if you have, forgive me, this is going to be a, a brief skip all over this topic, as a lot of these will be. But um, John Bartram came back from his explorations, and he started a botanical garden, and it was so popular and all these people that they knew from England and folks from the other part uh, of the colonies were so fascinated by the plants that they had and the fact that they had been able to bring these plants and establish them in a garden, a botanical garden, that guess what they did? They said, can we buy some of these from you? And the Bartram said, you know what, you can, let's figure something out. And so they basically came up with a newsletter where they would send out information about the plants that they discovered on their explorations, most of which were Florida and Southeast natives. Um, they would bring them back to Pennsylvania, grow them in their garden, and then promote them to people. And if folks were interested, they would send seed content or ship cuttings or ship plant material to these folks, often in England or Europe um, and all throughout the colony. So the Bartrams we know for their naturalist explorations, but also they were early commercial, uh, they were early entrepreneurs when it came to the plant trade. One really interesting thing about John Bartram uh, is he was appointed as, uh, excuse me, are the plants that he conserved and kind of led to us uh, discovering uh, as we study botany in the Southeast. So he was George III's botanist. He was appointed the botanist for North America by King George. And he had, you know, we know this as Farmer George. He was very supportive of agriculture, plants, horticulture. Um, and he used to get a lot of people involved in doing these activities for him. So obviously he couldn't come explore himself. So Bartram was funded by the crown to come and explore and document what he found. And as we have known from his writings, uh, he traveled extensively, um, but he found a flowering magnolia in Southeast Georgia in the swamps that he named Franklinia Alatamaha after his friend, Benjamin Franklin. And it was thought to be extinct in the wild um, since 1790. We now know that there have been some small populations of it found, but this plant Franklinia is well known to, you know, camellia relatives, or excuse me, magnolia, people who study magnolias and their relatives, um, and it was named for Benjamin Franklin, discovered or described by John Bartram. Um, and now it's grown in the nursery commercially, but really interesting plant uh, with a kind of an interesting history. William Bartram also explored Southern North America. He's the one that wrote Bartram's Travels. Many of us are familiar with him from that writings. Uh, he explored Paints Prairie close to home here in Gainesville and was given the name Puck Puggy. If you read a uh, history of this, some folks say this was an honor, a nickname that was given to him as an honor. Others say it was a disparaging term <laughs> given to him by the folks he found here. Um, I don't know, but it, it's interesting nonetheless to go and study up on that. But we know from Bartram's studies that he was able to describe and as we've seen cultivate and spread commercially, plants like Oakley hydrangea, uh, our native azaleas that we have, flame azaleas, plants like our hemerichalis, spider lilies, uh, bottle brush buckeye are natives. So these plants, even though they were around, uh, indigenous folks who've been in Florida knew about these, but they were described and discovered by these European descendants who came through and then promoted these plants in gardens and other areas, et cetera. Oh, thank you. Yeah, please, y'all, if you have recommendations for books, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end, but put them in the chat so we can all benefit from them. This is a great recommendation, Andrea Wolf's books. Um, I read both of those and they were excellent. Um, so yeah, if y'all have other suggestions, please, I'm all for sharing the knowledge. So Joseph Banks, how do y'all know Joseph Banks? Well, a lot of folks know him uh, through his voyages with James Cook. He was considered the rock star botanist of his time. So I know this I give this talk sometimes to students and they giggle when I say rock star botanist. Y'all are plant fans, so you probably get it. Um, but he was incredibly popular and was really a, a, a public figure because of his studies in botany. In his early days, he explored Newfoundland and Labrador, so he was relatively close to home. And he did monographs uh, describing the plant material of those areas in his studies. 
he was fortunate enough to be wealthy. He had a lot of land to fund his studies. So he was able to engage in these activities. Um, but he took a voyage on the endeavor with his buddy, James Cook. Um, and he also was really close with George III and Carl Linnaeus. So Banks had these connections that enabled him to both reach out to other folks who were interested in plants and plant explorers, but who also gave him the interest uh, and kind of a mission to go on when he was going plant exploring. So in his exploration, he collected quite a bit of uh, plant material that was then described by Linnaeus and then named uh, by banks or named for banks, excuse me, or named for where uh, they were found. Sorry, I just saw in the chat, this is a, I don't want to pause, but I don't want to forget to mention, this is a great point. Uh, Sandy mentioned, thank you, Sandy, that she'll look for plant references in old literature to see what it is written about and what was grown. So yeah, if you go through old, um, there's a whole discipline of this that's fascinating in English and uh, literature studies, but it, looking through literature, writings, paintings, to figure out how folks were using plants during those time periods. Um, great, great point. So because Banks was friends with Carl Linnaeus, plants that he found were named for him. So we know Banksia, but the whole genus of Banksia was named for Joseph Banks. Uh, the Banksia rose was named, some say for his lady, some say for him. Um, and when he had a you know, long and robust career going out and exploring for the king and with James Cook, did he retire? Well, no. If some of y'all are aware of this, he went on to unofficially start Kew Gardens. If you're familiar with Kew Gardens, it's the premier European botanical garden. Um, some say the global botanical garden. Uh, there's Singapore has some things to say about that, but basically it's a huge deal in botanical garden conservation, plant collection, uh, and research. Banks was unofficially the founder of Kew Gardens. It's described as the first true botanical garden, uh, definitely in Europe, possibly the world. And it was done with King George III, our farmer's support. Over the time of his tenure uh, with the garden, establishing the garden, Banks brought over 7,000 plants to England. So if you look ahead to David Fairchild, what he did for the United States through the USDA and Fairchild Gardens, Banks had very similar activities uh, in England during this time. Over 30 years, now this is his retirement, right? Quote unquote. Um, this is what he did. And it was plants that are very familiar to English and European gardeners, um, but were introduced during this time period. Things like pe tree peony, cycads, uh, tiger lily, wisteria, and lots more. Banks uh, enjoyed 42 years as president of the Royal Horticultural Society. Um, and he eventually did retire. I think he probably passed away working. I haven't quite, re I don't remember that, but I know I read it at one point. As we've seen, one of his contemporaries was Carl Linnaeus. And so Linnaeus had a Latinized name, Carolus Linnaeus. Um, he was a, a plant taxonomist, but as I've mentioned, we know him as the father of binomial nomenclature. So if you struggle with scientific names, uh, you have him to thank for it. But really, he wasn't really a, a researcher per se. He kind of was a lost the soul for a while. He didn't do well in school. Uh, the writings have mentioned that his he plagued his parents with his poor performance and his kind of lack of interest in anything. And so he was sent off to do some exploration and he went to Lapland. And while he was exploring Lapland, he thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm really interested in the plants here. So I'm gonna find out what they are and talk to the people who live here and what they do with these plants. So as a lot of y'all mentioned in the chat, he was trying to learn more about how plants were used ethnobotanically for medicine, for food, for other things, culture. And some uh, accounts of this time said that he went full Laplander. He just adopted the culture. He uh, had a host family he lived with. He got involved with everything that he, you know, he could to try to become a Laplander, including the plants and um, the culture, how the plants, how they use the plants. He married a woman from that area. And have, as we've seen through his writings, he eventually came to regret that decision, whether domestic life wasn't for him or it was the individual he chose. There were quotes from his writings and correspondences with friends that say she turned almost overnight into a dragon and he was to regard her with respect and terror for the rest of his life. Uh, not the best domestic situation, so we can see why he really was into plants and we know Linnaeus described thousands and thousands of plants based on their morphology. What did the flowers look like? If they were close together, he grouped them. Now we have DNA analysis. Oh, I apologize y'all, my slides got all wonky and I thought I had fixed this but hopefully you can see it all right. So we go back, we're still in 18th century exploration here. Um, and one folk, one guy that I would like, one individual that I would like to mention, we know as a huge historical figure, but he's also significant to plant exploration for a good reason. Um, we know Captain William Bly, right, from the Bounty, Bounty Mutiny on the Bounty, books, movies, the whole nine yards, uh, familiar. If you're not familiar with it, 
there was a mutiny. He got, you know, tossed over overboard, didn't end well for him. Uh, he had a journey, did okay, kind of got home, went out again. And he, it didn't end well for him. So Captain William Bly uh, was recommended for this job by Joseph Banks, who was a big deal as we've seen in horticulture. So he came highly recommended, but he didn't do so well on this breadfruit expedition to Tahiti. What happened was Q Gardens and Joseph Banks found out uh, that breadfruit was used, again, exploration leading to plant hunting, that breadfruit was used and was a great nutritional source for folks living in the tropical islands. And so he said, hey, can you go get us some of this plant? We could probably use it here as a food resource, um, bring it back. So they took this expedition down and Bly served under, Cap or served under Cook during a brief period of time. So he had another good recommendation and he went on this expedition to look for breadfruit. Well, as we know, uh, they mutinied and he ended up bringing back a single breadfruit plant, um, but they had, I think uh, two dozen at the time and they none of them made it. Um, but yeah, oh, Aaron just read a book on mutiny on the bounty. So you're probably can fill in all my historical uh, gaps there. The expedition I'm not quite as familiar with, but I do know that uh, he was out there for botany. Oh, good, more recommendations in the chat. So let's look ahead. We've talked a lot about men, but we know that women played a big role in plant exploration. Thank you, Erin. Um, and sadly, as with much of women's history, um, they have gone either undescribed or were assumed to be men because of how they had to operate in the culture to do what they wanted to do with plant material. And one example of this was Jean Beret. Um, I apologize, hablo espanol, I don't speak French, so if I'm mangling her name, uh, apologies, but she was technically the first woman to circumnavigate the globe on a ship. She snuck on board the Etoile. She was uh, kind of a headstrong woman. She was had to raise herself very independent. Um, she had parents who were herbalists, and so she was brought up in this tradition for you know going out and sourcing things from nature. She would do plant exploration close to home to find herbs, and so she was really motivated to go exploring. And she snuck on board this ship, and she was disguised as a cabin boy. The captain of the ship was named Captain de Bougainville, and he wasn't named for the plant, vice versa. So our plant Bougainvillea that we know is in the picture there was named because of this expedition. Um, Jean Beret was the herbalist. She was the kind of unofficial botanist on board. Uh, when you read the book that describes this that I checked out, she kind of was described as someone who basically uh, did all the work because the folks who had been appointed to be the botanist didn't know what they were doing. And because she had been raised as an herbalist, she was able to help them as they went on their plant exploration. She did all right on the journey for a while, but they got to Tahiti, some things happened, she got sick, and so they discovered that she was a woman. She had been such a key crew member and so, you know, clutched to the journey that uh, nothing bad happened to her. They were really upset and some folks, you know, wanted bad things to happen, but the, they, she was saved by the crew effectively. They relocated her to Mauritius for her own, as they said, safety, but she also wanted to stay there and keep doing plant exploration. As she aged and retired, she eventually was pensioned by the French Navy for her work and returned to France um, in a happy retirement. So we see now we have Bougainvillea to thank, uh, her to thank for Bougainvillea as we have described today. Um, so next time you see Bougainvillea, if you will, think about Jean Beret um, and tip a hat for her enterprising spirits. Other explorers that we know very well who did not go disguise, uh, Lewis and Clark. So as we know, I learned Lewis and Clark, they were looking for the Northwest Passage. There have been many dramatizations of what they did and what they were actually looking for. Um, oh gosh, and I'm sorry, I'll again, the, the slide is obscuring my formatting, got all weird. That's a plant, we'll talk about it. So they were looking for the Northwest Passage across the Americas. Uh, we know that they were looking also for uh, different types of resources. So sources for fur or water or other things, places they could grow plants. They were also looking for plants. And one of the reasons, I think somebody mentioned Jefferson in the chat, I didn't have time to read, but I thought I saw it. Um, their buddy, Thomas Jefferson said, hey, can you try to find some plants for me? I've got this great farm going. I'm really into plant material. I've been corresponding and talking to other people about it um, in Europe and also in the colonies. And they said, sure. So while they were going on their journey, whenever they found something that was on Jefferson's list or something interesting, they would document it and either uh, preserve it by pressing or send it back um, or just write about it. And so because of this, we have early descriptions of plants like Berberis, uh, bayberry, fritillaries, which don't grow here in Florida, but they're beautiful plants, things like Lysianthus, uh, lady slipper orchids, and valerian. And I can't remember what the TA was in there, um, but lots of interesting plant material. And a lot of this was because of Thomas Jefferson's interest in plants. So this plant exploration uh, was spurred by Jefferson, who was stuck back home um, and couldn't go exploring on his own because he was busy doing what he was doing. Jefferson had an acquaintance in France. Uh, I use acquaintance as loosely as possible because there's lots of accounts of their relationship. 
um, but her name was Madame de Tessé, and uh, Culvertaria paniculata was named in part because of her, was described in part because of his relationship with her. So even Jefferson himself did quite a bit of uh, plant exploration and naming in the interest of passion. So in the 19th century, there was a gentleman named Robert Fortune, and he has a very spotty history, but I bring him up because he had a huge impact, good, bad, or ugly, on plant exploration and horticulture in general. And he's an example or illustration of some of the ugly side of plant exploration and plant hunting. So Robert Fortune was commissioned by the British East India Company. And what they really wanted to do was create a larger uh, source of tea so that they could cut off the middleman and start producing it themselves. So they wanted to bring tea from China to India. And the texts that I read initially for this talk had a very generous description. And if you look on Wikipedia, it's very interesting how they describe this. They say he introduced tea to India from China. Well, what he did was he stole it. <laughs> he asked for permission and he was told no. Um, he tried to get some local farmers to help him out. And they were like, no, we're not helping you. You can't have our tea. They knew what they had. Um, and plus it was a significant cultural resource. It wasn't something that they were necessarily comfortable trading. So Robert Fortune disguised himself um, as a Chinese farmer and then went and collected the plants illegally. She got them across the border to India where they then established farms for tea. So when we see why tea came to India, it's because of Robert Fortune um, and his disguising and his, his illicit plant hunting. He also described and collected plants like blue peonies, uh, peaches, so some other plants, whether they were shared willingly or not, I'm not aware, but lots of other plants were aware of because of his activity and his work. Balloon flower, if you're familiar with that, or Dicentra bleeding heart, not the Clarodendron bleeding heart, um, Chinese fringe tree, not the native, but the other, <laughs> and then plants like Abelia, um, kumquat, things like that. So Robert Fortune, he looks pretty grumpy. I mean, you know, I, maybe he did what he had to do. Who knows? Who knows what he, what he was doing? We also see a woman who is one of my personal heroes. Uh, she is one reason why I got so interested in this and I could do the whole talk just on Marianne North. Um, she was a botanical artist and she was fortunate to have a family who really supported her interest in plants. She didn't have a typical path, you know, uh, domesticity for a woman in England. She, uh, her father, her mother died early. Her father encouraged her to uh, study and he taught her quite a bit. So she was very well educated and he took her with him on her his travels. So when he passed away, he left the estate to her and she decided to just go out on her own, which was very unusual for a woman during that time. But she traveled literally everywhere she could. She went all over the world. And we know this because she has beautiful illustrations that she did uh, along the way. One interesting thing about Marianne North was not only did she draw the plants, but she also drew the context in which the plants were growing and used. So if you go and look at her illustrations, you'll see these beautiful landscapes. And I apologize, that photo was bigger. Um, but if you look it up, you can see her uh, illustrations. She has a gallery at Kew Gardens that was established for her art. And it's all there. Amazing. There's a book. Um, but she would draw the plants and how the local folks who grew the plants used them, whether it was farming, uh, collecting for medicinal purposes, she would often draw pollinators with the plants. And this was unusual because if you're familiar with botanical illustration, it's typically very dry. It just shows, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's meant to show just the morphology, what the plant looks like. It's not meant to show how the plant is used. So this is a really dynamic, interesting way of exploring plants and documenting it for people back home. In addition to that change, she also used really bright, vibrant, gorgeous, bright colors so people could see how the tropics looked, um, not just in illustrations or, uh, you know, other things. She had uh, folks who studied under her. She taught Ellis Rowan in Australia, who's known for botanical illustration and collecting. Eventually, she retired in England. And as I mentioned, this gallery at Kew was established. And I always have to pitch this because when folks go to Kew Gardens in uh, England, they're usually, you know, focusing on the plants and going to look for all the interesting plant collections in the glass houses. But if you turn and go to the Marianne North Gallery, I promise you won't regret it if you're interested in this at all. Beautiful place. But Marianne North was an amazing uh, plant explorer. Okay, let's skip ahead a little bit to a gentleman named George Forrest. Uh, he collected, and again, more hot goss, more interesting backstory for this plant collection, but uh, he was a chemist by trade and he was looking for medicinal plants. And so as we see today in, um, you know, today's plant exploration, many folks were, are out looking for medicines or alternatives to things that are used that maybe uh, don't grow as well or aren't as practical. So this is effectively what he was doing. He was part of the Australian gold rush. He was not successful. Um, so he ended up going back and working with the botanical garden in Edinburgh. He traveled to China on behalf of the botanical garden to collect plant material. 
Um, he, uh, this is another case of a European going and making himself unwelcome in China, but he went and so angered the locals for his collection of rhododendrons that he had to escape uh, after being discovered in disguise to get out of the country. Um, but he did manage to collect and send back many species used for herbarium and cultivation, um, plants like pieris, catoni asters, which we know from northern gardens, not so much here in Florida. Um, but again, this plant exploration leading to plant hunting that didn't end so well. How do we do this today? Well, we have permits and often we will work in conjunction with the countries from which we're collecting the plants. Um, we see this starting in many places, but one place we see this starting was with David Fairchild. David Fairchild was, uh, if you're familiar with Florida garden history, Fairchild Gardens, it was named for him. His home estate was the Kampong. Uh, he was the first chief of the USDA for plant and seed introduction. So as the name states, the United States tasks the USDA division with going and finding new plant material that we can use for commodities or resources um, or to solve problems. He started, uh, he had PI number one, he had the first collection that was documented. And over his career, he introduced hundreds of thousands of plants to the United States. It was well over 200,000, something more. But plants like soybeans, if you think about how critical soybeans are to our agricultural economy, uh, plants we love like mangoes, nectarines, ficus, you name it. And if you ever visit the Kampong, you can see things like the very first jacaranda that was brought to the United States or the very first, you know, bengalensis that was brought here. So Fairchild, even though we know him for starting the botanical garden, he was able to do this because he was a plant explorer and a plant hunter, but also a plant explorer. He did this with the government's permission and often uh, even then didn't have full cooperation, but often did with the countries he was visiting because he was working on behalf of the US government. We see going forward as folks get more involved with researching plants and doing plant exploration from a scientific technical perspective, a lot more structure and uh, organization around this. So Richard Evan Schultz was a Harvard grad student who was doing his research and he described a uh, plant that was a fungus. This isn't a plant, but it's an interesting look at uh, what happens with ethnobotany and research sometimes. So he just did his grad study on this mushroom. He didn't really think much of it. It got filed away like many feces and dissertations do, sadly. They don't always get read again, but hopefully they do. Um, and a few decades, a decade or so later, a few years later, 15, uh, somebody reads these articles. Uh, Time Life did a profile, or excuse me, he read this research, right, going through uh, the, thesis of Schultz. So the big, I'm just thinking about how it would feel as a graduate student to have somebody call me because they read my thesis and went, we want to turn this into a money-making opportunity, right? It would be a dream come true for a graduate student. So this banker reads the articles that the student wrote. He goes to Mexico to try to find the mushrooms and figure out more and kind of fill in the gaps that the research didn't. Um, and he writes an article in Life Magazine about hallucinogenic mushrooms. And this is how in the 60s we end up getting the magic mushroom culture was because of this graduate student's work that was then publicized um, and then it built this whole movement right with mushrooms. Um, this was an example of ethnobotany uh, and we've seen many of this many examples of it being used before this and we will see many after this, but it was a case where ethnobotanical uses of a plant um, were studied in a legitimate way, right, where they were just trying to do research and figure out how the plant was used, maybe quantify what was in it. Um, and then it becomes so popular that it then uh, sometimes compromises the initial source. We saw this happen with Amorphophallus titanum, um, which I don't talk about in this talk, but if you're familiar with voodoo lily, uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening with its initial source, how it's used ethnobotanically, and then what's happening to the population because it's so popular in botanical gardens, people can't get enough of it. Um, and so the initial population is being compromised. Some folks say that Schultz was the initial Indiana Jones. Um, I don't know about that, but some people think he was the inspiration for the character. So where are plant explorers now? Uh, if you know people like Carlos Magdalena, who works at Kew, if you don't look him up, he's a fascinating plant explorer. Uh, people like Dan Hinckley, who is still active, but he for a long time was incredibly active and ran Heron's Wood Gardens out in the Pacific Northwest. Um, other folks are doing a lot of work. Uh, there are people at Arboreta, botanical gardens, plant companies out there doing plant exploration. And sometimes they're doing plant hunting too, but the benefit of today's plant exploration and plant hunting is because it's conducted by these conservation societies or conservation minded enterprises. Um, it's almost it's always done with permitting if it's legal and it's almost always done with uh, the interest of or the research motivation of the host country. So often it's a conservation effort and a botanical garden can help right or it's a, a plant that needs to have a problem solved. And so they go collecting and exploring. So modern plant exploration is still very active. 
Um, if we look again, like I said, at people like botanical garden employees or researchers or conservationists, those folks are all doing plant exploration. And then, like we mentioned at the beginning, people like illustrators, photographers, artists, you and I are plant explorers. So as you go and do your research on your favorite plant, um, that thank you is obscured, <laughs> uh, but I hope you will feel like you are getting uh, a lot out of it, but also by doing the searching and the exploration, you're also giving back to the whole discipline. So I'll leave you with a quote from John Muir, who's one of my favorites, and I apologize, my voice is going, but uh, it's in every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. So hopefully, Plant exploration leaves you in a similar position. Um, and if you have questions, there's my email. Jen, if I forgot anything, let me know. But I'll be happy to take questions if anyone has them. Yeah, uh, let's take some questions. Does anybody, let me see, the q and um, It's just about the chat box being disabled. Um, there, I saw a comment about Andrea Wolf's books. <laughs> Uh, the Brother Gardeners and the Founding Gardeners. I just want to say the Founding Gardeners is a fantastic book. Um, if you're at all interested in this topic, I um, agree. really good book. Uh, I haven't read the Brother Gardeners, but um, I'm sure it's just as fascinating. It's good. I'll put a couple. Uh, of yeah, go chat. ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say I'll put a couple other books in the chat as well. That'd be great. Uh, and if y'all have any, I know someone mentioned American Eden, also a great book. Uh, I read that. Botany and Medicine in the Garden of the Early Republic. Very good. Um, yes, Henry Kern with Keelan. There's so many people I couldn't talk about. <laughs> um, and I'm going to minimize the screen. If anyone needs my email, I will put it um, in the chat for you. Um, oh, good. Anyway, worry about David Fairchild. Emily, a comedic pan piano duet. Is that for us? No, I'm trying to copy and paste yours because it just went to hosts and panelists. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't. Oh, there's everyone. I got it. <laughs> I'm terrible at Zoom chats, y'all. Uh, Michael Pollan has some great books. His chapter on tea and coffee and your mind on plants is amazing. It was one of the um, comments. Uh, well, that's my Zoom office. Don't click that. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have the same problem I do. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. There's a, a book called Plant Hunters that I was trying to look up the uh, author of until I realized I was in the wrong chat. But if anyone has read that, that's an excellent book as well. If you know the author, please pop it in there. Otherwise, I'll look it up. Um, yeah. There are also classes on plant exploration that we haven't really, uh, I didn't discuss. Michael Pollan, yes, he's an amazing, he's he does kind of uh, what I do as a lecturer, well, he does much deeper research for his books, but he'll go and learn everything he can about a topic and do some amazing uh, mm -hmm. writing. And I just finished Your Mind on Plants. That was really fascinating. Um, Botany of Desire also kind of gives you mm -hmm. interesting. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, 50 Plants That Changed the Course of History Bill Laws mm -hmm. uh, was another one mm -hmm. suggested. Um, I think that was it. Yeah, the plant but it's a, oh, it's a great it's a great topic. Um, lots of books to read on it. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, oh yes. I don't see any uh, questions. So if nobody has any questions. Um, then I think that, well, people keep putting books in. So How to Become a Modern Day Plant Explorer, The Plant Hunters by Carolyn Fry. Um, that was you who put that in there. I did. Um, <laughs> also, so, if y'all are interested, I'll just leave you with this. Um, oh yes, that book about by Wade Davis is very good. I haven't read that in a long time. I need to reread it, Paulette. One River by Wade Davis, and that's about Schultz. Um, if you are interested in learning more about what's going on today, uh, look up the New York Botanical Garden, Arnold Arboretum, Kew Gardens. They all have active plant exploration programs, and many of them now have outreach on the web where you can go watch their explorers doing research in the field that they videotape to show people during uh, the pandemic. So take advantage of these online resources, y'all. And thank you for taking advantage of this one.
Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for coming to talk to us. Um, fabulous topic. Um, we we all learned a lot, and everybody's saying thank you in the um, in the chat. So um, uh, everybody have a great day, and Aaron, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Emily. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.